Good afternoon. This is January 8, 2008. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today William F. O'Brien. Welcome, Bill. Thank you for coming. Nice to be here. May I ask you when and where you were born? I was born in Providence, Rhode Island on April 12, 1921. And what is your current address? My current address in Natick. And how long have you lived in Natick? I've lived in Natick approximately about 40 years. Speaking of Natick, have you seen a lot of major changes over the past 40 years? Well, certainly along Route 9 uh, would be some major changes, but uh, other than that, it's, well, there's, there's growth throughout Natick. Is it as friendly a town as it was back 40 years ago? I think so. And what is your marital status? I am married to my wife, Mary Holden, and I have four children. And you have grandchildren? And five grandchildren. Do they live in the area? Uh, they live in the greater Boston area, the one in Taunton, and one in Boston, and one in Cambridge, and my daughter, Paula, lives with us in Natick. Where and when did you enter the military? I entered the military in Providence, Rhode Island in or about August of 1942. Why? Why did you go? Well, we, <laughs> we were at war mm -hmm. and I had to uh, make a decision of what I thought I could do best. So I thought probably the Army Air Force they offered an examination in the local public school, and I took the examination and passed for aviation cadet. At that time, were you in high school? I'm sorry? Were you in high school at that time? At that time, no. I was out of high school about two years. And at that time, it was the Air Force, but it was the Army Air the Force. The Army Air Force, that's right. Had you been working prior to going in? Yes, I worked uh, after graduating from high school. I worked with where my father was working, Dave Wall Rubber Company. They made pharmaceutical uh, rubber goods. And then uh, I also, I, the, the story goes that I took the uh, Army uh, I swore, was sworn into the Army, but they did not uh, bring me up right away, so I got a job uh, cutting grass at Roger Williams Park in Providence, and really? that was fun. Yeah, yeah. So how long before they called you up? It was about maybe two and a half to three months. And when they did call you, where did you go? I went to Kelly Field in Texas. How long were you there for? Not too long a time. It was a, at, at Kelly Field. I had about four or five days of just extreme ex, of examinations, uh, intelligence exam, dexterity, uh, sight, all of the uh, attributes or all of the things that's necessary to be in the flying business. Had you chosen that branch for any special reason? Have I cho did I chose the Air Force? Right. Not really. I did not know too much about flying. I was born in, a, in an Irish tenement uh, culture, uh, but I knew I had to make a decision, so I was looking at the uh, Merchant Marine Academy down in New London, and I was looking also at the Coast Guard and the Navy, and the Air Force, but when I saw that the Air Force was offering this examination, I thought, well, I might as well go in and take it, and I passed. 
Did any family or friends join in the service at the same time? I would say yes. Each the number of friends that I had, and they were all about my age, uh, it was shortly after the, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and so we thought we had, each one of us uh, in, their, in our own mind decided what we wanted to do, and I would say that uh, most of them uh, joined the service. When you were taking the exams, after you took the, uh, the four to five days of exams at Kelly Field, then right. did you start specific training of any kind? I was transferred then to Ellington Field. Is that in Texas also? In Texas. I think that's close to Houston, I'm not sure. And uh, we, I started what they call ground school. It, I had to go to school just like I was going to uh, classes in high school or college, and that we had college professors. And the subjects were like physics, geometry, trigonometry, meteorology, and that type of uh, conditioning that you needed to be a flyer. Did you know that's what you would get into? that type of training? No, I was never sure of that. It, was, it, it came on kind of sudden. You All of a sudden you take the exam, you pass, and you're told to go, and I, I never actually had any desire to do fly before that time. But it's just the way it worked then. And were you good at math in high school? I did take a scientific course at LaSalle Academy in Providence and where I did have all of those subjects that uh, helped me once I had joined the service. So once you took the ground school right. training, how long did that last, by the way? I would say a couple of months. And then what? Then I went to uh, fly, then it was a question of flying of uh, bombardering where we were sent to a school that was strictly uh, training for to be bombardiers. And we had training planes, I think they were called AT-10s. Uh, and uh, that lasted for a specific time. Uh, I can't give you the exact time, but anyway, a couple of months. And was that also in Texas? That was also in Texas. Did you befriend a group at that point? Was there a unit that was together? Not then, mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. But once I was commissioned a second lieutenant, I was uh, then, uh, we formed then, we formed groups where we went to a certain base and we got what they call phase training. And phase training is when you Pick your, your captain and the pilots and the co-pilots and the navigators and your gunners and your radio man and your bombardier. And I was the bombardier with a group of people, with these 10 people. So between the time you went to Kelly Field, then to Ellington Field, and then you jumped forward to being commissioned, how much time are we talking here, approximately? Uh, I was commissioned, I was, went to Kelly Field in August of 42, and I was commissioned in April 4th of 93. 43? 43, I'm sorry. 93. A second lieutenant. Second lieutenant. So obviously they thought very highly of you to... <laughs> Well, I, it, I, they were putting them through awfully fast at that time. Yeah. They had a, they had a big, they had a missions in mind, and uh, and uh, it, it was beefed up uh, to to include a lot of people. Now, why was your why was your decision, or whose decision was it for you to become a bombardier? At Kelly Field, after the examinations, I was told that's the type of uh, that's the career I should go to. And what exactly does a bombardier do? Well, a bombardier had to learn to 
used the Norton bomb site because the Americans believed in precision bombing. And uh, we had to uh, learn to work when and how to uh, use the bomb site. And technically, when a plane uh, was going over a mission, over a target, it's the, they put it on automatic pilot that is connected to the northern bomb site, and the bombardier actually is putting the adjustments through that automatic pilot to, uh, to, to get the, on the bombing run, as they called it. Where did you sit in the plane? In the nose, just behind the plexiglass in a flying fortress, a B-17. And the so navigator did, was with me. So did you become closer to the navigator than, say, the pilot, as far as friendships go? Or oh, were you all a group? I don't think so. I think we operated as a group. There was no, none of that military decorum that you might get. Uh, no one ever called a person by rank. It was always Jim and Joe. And so no how matter. many would be in a B-17? Pardon? How many of you would be in a B-17? Well, 10. And you all had a different job to do. That's right. So you were commissioned a second lieutenant in April of 43. Right. In Texas. Right. Then what? Then I went to the phase training where we were selected to go to sit with our group. We formed then the the uh, group of people that we were going to be working with. And that also was in Texas? That's also in Texas. And the phase training was a couple of months also? Yes. All right. And at what point then did you really feel like you were a unit and ready to go? Well, I would say after that phase training, we got to know each other. We kind of... Uh, it was free and we were loose and, you know, it was, it was very, very informal. And did you know at that time that this would take you to Europe or did you? No. You had no idea at that no. point. So after the phase training was over, what happened? After the phase training was over, we were sent to Lincoln, Nebraska as a marshalling point. And they then were making decisions how we were to go and where we were to go. And how long were you in Lincoln? Oh, there was only a week or so. And when did you find out then? Shortly after that Shortly week? Shortly after that, we were, our, my particular unit was sent to uh, uh, Norfolk, Virginia, where we got on Liberty ships because we were going to be a replacement crew. You were going to be a replacement group, and did you know at that time it would be in Europe, or? Actually, we sailed to Casablanca in North Africa. How was that? <laughs> well, th there again, it was a landing, and we just, I was in the Casablanca for only a very short time. Uh, probably, you know, until they could get it organized to fly us into Tunis, where, my, where I finally was, was uh, the, the, the base that we were to be permanently connected with. Was in Tunis. It was in Tunis. What was, do you remember what your feeling was like when you were on one of the Liberty ships going to Casablanca? Uh, as you mentioned earlier, an Irish boy from a tenement going to <laughs> strange lands. Well, I think that that was the, the order of the day. Many, many, many people went in different directions. Uh, your, your other friends were out in the Pacific, and they, you know, they were born in, in the same culture and the mm -hmm. same environment that I was born in, and we, we landed all over. So when you landed in Tunis, what were your first impressions? Well, it, it was... We were connected to what the 301st Bomb Group, and we just went to the uh, so-called base, 
and uh, we were, you know, told the mission of the, you know, how we were to proceed, and, and uh, it was it was different because uh, it was, you know, the first time I've seen camels walking in the desert, and, and uh, it was, you know, it was it was from Cal uh, from Casablanca to Tunis, and uh, it was interesting that flight we t flew from Casablanca to Tunis. We could look down on the desert and we saw the destruction of many vehicles that had taken place that when the British uh, Montgomery was fighting Rommel. Rommel? Rommel. Rommel. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> Rommel. You could see that. Right. I could see the, the aftermath of it. What were your impressions of it at that time? Well, it was, you know, it was a lot of desert, and thank God I never had to work down there because uh, it looked like there was a long period of places where there was no type of civilization. So you had mentioned you're with the 301st Bomb Group. Right. And you were told at that point in Tunis what your mission was going to be. What was your mission going to be? Well, the... If once you were once you were working with the group, uh, a mission was extremely secretive. Uh, we would go into a uh, closed room at uh, that the evening before, and all the shades would be down, and they would I guess scan it at times if they want, and then they would tell you put the maps on the wall and they would tell you uh, what the mission would be the following day. And uh, you, you learn the terrain and you learn what you might be up against and uh, where they knew that there was a lot of what they call flak, which would be anti-aircraft. Anti and uh, and you, you just went from there. You went to bed and got up and went. Were you nervous about that? <laughs> You're 22 years old. It's a little different than if I was doing it today. <laughs> so was there a sense of adventure? I hope not. I mean, that's, uh, I never had, I didn't have the sensibilities that I have today about destruction and war. But uh, I would say one thing, that they always told you of a military target. It was never open bombing of any cities. It was either a ball bearing factory, oil wells, an airport, uh, a uh, shipping area like when you went to Marseille, France, and you bombed. And we bombed the Brenner Pass, the, a viaduct that goes between across the Alps. And uh, so you did have, when we in Neustadt, where they made uh, German fighter planes. So you never really uh, felt you were bombing people, so, but that's not right. I know by now they were there, but uh, for the most part, you, you had an objective, of, which was military. And there was a sense that these were military targets, as you said, and not homes. Right. <clears throat> How many mi missions did you go on? I only went on 10 missions before I was shot down. Tell us about that day. <laughs> well, that was a crazy day because my crew that we, I worked so diligently with in this phase training business in Texas, I, I just want to back up a bit. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was sent that week, a week, to take a course in Tunis at a, in a uh, hangar in a, new, in a new method of using equipment. Okay, so when I came back to the base, my crew had left for Italy. And I was in Africa, so I went to bed that night thinking, the night before, that I was going to uh, catch up with them the following day. But about four or five o'clock in the morning, someone shook me 
and a person, an enlisted man, said, they want you on the line. So Obama and Dad got sick, and they want you to fill in for them. So I went to the, I, then all I, the, the planes were been, being warmed up, so all I got was a cup of coffee and a slice of bread. <laughs> and uh, let me see, I went to the plane, and I'd never met any of the people, didn't know them from zero. And so I jumped in the bomb and air spot, and we took off, and we headed for the target. They filled me in what the target was going to be. I didn't go to the briefing. And where was the target? The target was in uh, Athens, Greece. And what happened? Well, the flak, which is a, a, a word for, it's like an anti, today would be a ground to air missile. But at that time it was just a, a, a bomb that exploded in the air when the planes were going through. And somebody, we were about 28,000 feet, and I got hit. Did the, did you get injured? Did I get injured? Yeah. Well, don't tell Carl Rowe, but I got a purple heart for it, but I didn't get injured. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I was only injured and when, I, I got out of the plane, and I was only injured because the parachute started to swing back and forth, and I got swing sickness, and I started to throw up, and I couldn't get rid of it because it was going back and forth. And then by the time I hit the ground, I think I was in shock. So I, uh, I hit the ground pretty hard, and I could hardly walk, and the Germans that were there to pick me up. Uh, took me to the hospital, where so, I was there for a couple of days. So back up, what was it like when you were hit, and where were you hit, and what happened to the rest of the men? Well, we were carrying what they call fragmentation bombs, because we were bombing an airport that where German bombers were flying out of, harassing the convoys that were going from Africa to Italy. In other words, I should have been on one of those convoys. But anyway, they, they were doing that particular type of work. And so our mission was to, to I had, they call them anti-personnel bombs, where they, they, they go for ground targets. And uh, they happened to get hit, and they started to explode inside the, the bomb bay. So we got, uh, you know, we had to jump. Quickly. Quickly. Very yeah. quickly. What yeah. were you? Do you remember what you were feeling? When no. Was, no. No. No feeling. Okay. Just survival. And this was winter, but it, you, it was. Well, winter, the temperatures were low because you were you were as high as almost Mount Everest. Okay. But they, they, the 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 ground underneath was warm. I mean, in other words, uh, you were flying. I don't know what the temperature is in Athens in the in December but it's very warm. I probably, it's equal to almost our Florida. I'm so sure. as soon as you hit the ground, the Germans were there? Oh yeah, So it was the, the city. Wow. What about the rest of your men? Well, four died. Do you know how soon, and I'm jumping a little, but we'll go back to this right. piece how soon after this occurred that your regular crew heard about you? I never knew that. I never found out, okay. except that eventually, when I was in the prison camp, they had to build a new prison camp from in the area, and one day, sure enough, they came through, and I spotted them. <laughs> and they, you know, hi. So they were in a prison camp also? Eventually. Okay. Not the same day. Eventually, they got hit. So you got hit, you were injured and probably in shock, but the Germans did bring you to a well, hospital? Sick and shocked, okay. maybe. I, was, I couldn't, the, you know, I only had the cup of coffee and a piece of bread. So I, I was throwing up and uh, I guess it's vomiting and you couldn't get any grip to anything to vomit 
and you were just throwing it up in your room. My whole front of my fly suit was full of uh, gunk. And could you speak uh, German? No. Could any of them speak English? Yes. Were they nice to you? Yes. They were. And you, how long were you in the hospital, did you say? A few days? A couple days? of days. And did you know right away, did, were you given rights, re, read your rights, or were they agreeing to any kind of war laws or anything like no, that? No, it was just a couple of nurses rub my back and put heat on it. Uh -huh. But just to go back a little bit, but the first thing, when I hit the ground, the first thing the German soldier, the, the German officer said to me, he looked up, he says, there's the Acropolis. Did you, ever think, did you ever think that you would see it? <laughs> I said, no. And uh, he laughed, and he offered me a cigarette. It's very kind. And he, he dismissed all the other people except a, a, an aide, his aide, and uh, they drove me to the hospital. That's all. There was no, and then in the hospital. Hospital, they just put in the bed, and nobody ever did say or do anything to it. They didn't even have a guard on me. Were you scared? Not really. I don't think it's, it's something takes over. You know, I could see they were friendly. Right. And then from the hospital, did they tell you ahead of time what was going to happen, or you no. assumed from training that you would go to a camp? I guess so, yeah. He thought you'd be under your prisoner of war. Do you know what camp you were in? The name of your camp that you were in? Where? When? Eventually? Well, after you got out of the hospital, right. what happened? After I got out of the hospital, uh, they, uh, I flew in a German plane, uh, like a uh, DC uh, regular plane, and there were a lot of brass on that plane, and we flew to Salonika. Now, where is that? Then Salonika, I think, is in the northern part of Greece. Did they tell you that's where you were going, or you just didn't know? No, it was mm -hmm. just to get on the plane and go. And then what happened? Well, then I jumped into a. Then they had a rail. There was. Then we picked up a couple of other POWs that were not on my mission. And we went by train down along the uh, Asiatic Sea, and, and uh, we went through the countries of Albania, Serbia, my geography now, Yugoslavia, uh, parts of Yugoslavia, and I think we went into Hungary and Czechoslovakia, and uh, then. Um, that, and then we went, I ended up the day after Christmas in Vienna, yeah. in now, the Vienna Railroad Station. Was this a cattle car type of train, or was no, it comfortable? It, Did you it have was, seats? Uh, it was a, at this particular time, it was, a, it was like a caboose that was added to a freight train. And there was only a very few of us, and there was one or two guards. That's why I spent Christmas Eve. On the train? I think it was, on, I think it was Christmas Eve that was on the train. Now, what about any of the other members of your plane who did make it? Did you ever see I them? I didn't, never caught up with them. Mm -hmm. they, they were in a different, I don't know what happened in the sense of that sense of the, the, the trip they took. But I was, on, I was the only one in my, of that flight that was on that little particular train. So once you're in Vienna, what Oh, Vienna was where they started. They, they, it was, I, I never saw so many people in my life, soldiers, German soldiers. And, and uh, they had soup kitchens where these big pots of soup and every German soldier had a canteen, and we were given a canteen. And you stood in a snake line to get uh, up to the kettle, and then they'd take a laden, 
and they'd jump it in your thing there and you had a spoon and you'd find a corner and go and eat and I mean, if you were German and if you were a prisoner of war, you know, you had to go to a certain area and there was just a guy with a gun that was there. He, he, was, he had his soup too. Not to sound trivial, but what were you wearing at that time? My flight uniform. You were still with your flight They let me wash that in Athens. Uh -huh. I washed it uh, from the time I got out of the hospital to the time I f took the flight. And I got all of the, uh, I tried to get all of the gunk on it that was on it from my body. So how long were you in Vienna? Pardon? How long were you in Vienna? Oh, just, they just, uh, a couple of days maybe, it was just big muddles and then they, but then they put us in a cattle car, uh -huh. in, a, in a box car. What do you remember about that? Pardon? What do you remember about that? The boxcar? Well, that was pretty spooky. Um, we were f then going from Vienna, I believe, up to Frankfurt, Germany. And one night we were put on a siding, and uh, the uh, uh, and the sirens rang out, and uh, all of a sudden or after maybe a 20 or 30 minutes after the siren started, the bomb started to go off, and they, we were in a flak nest where the Germans had the anti-aircraft guns, and there were explosions. Uh, but I don't think the bombing was probably, it wasn't immediate. You could hear the bombs whistle and bang, and then it's kind of shake, but I think they were at least five, ten miles away. Because you, you couldn't, it wasn't, of course you could have got hit, but, uh, but the, the flak guns, in other words, the Germans would have the whole town, I mean the surrounding, and they were just pouring it all up, trying to knock. It was the British that were doing that, the RAF. They bombed at night. They, they had what they call saturation bombing. Saturation bombing means that uh, you get over a certain area of a target and you just unload your bombs. Where precision bombing, you try to go in by a bomb site to get a specific bomb. Specific target, target. and yeah. get out, right. okay. Were you feeling very alone at that time? I wasn't. <laughs> No, we had, I had the uh, support of, of everybody else. They were all, that was the night that they were all praying and everything. And so this, you're in this boxcar to the Frankfurt, Germany area. Did you know at that point in time what your final destination was? No, mm -hmm. we went up to Frankfurt on the main. And um, there was another little experience there. When we got out of the boxcar, we had to walk a couple of miles to a, I guess, a, 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 a trucks. But the, in between, we walked beside uh, uh, buildings that had been destroyed. And the civilian women and older men came up and took rocks and were throwing them at us. And they were calling us American gangsters. Now the reason that that happened at that time, they had a plane that got knocked down just previous to the, that particular time, and it was called Mur Murder Incorporated, and a B-17. And the Germans made a lot of fuss about that in their papers, and if they were calling that was every American so soldier or, or Air Force person was a gangster. And you know it's natural, and sure. their homes were they were standing on rubble. Sure. You know they probably had mortgages like we did, and all of a sudden they have nothing. So you're walking for a few miles, and you're you're meeting up with people who obviously were not happy with you, and you got to these trucks. And Where then we were taken to a camp. Do you remember the name of the camp? No, it was a it was a. Uh, uh, it was just a staging area. A staging camp. So yeah. you're only there temporarily? Hmm? Only yes. there temporarily? Yes. And then what? Well, then we were sent 
not all of us, but some of us were sent to the Stalag Luft One, and that was in Bath, Germany, and that's where my that this took thirty days uh, from the time I was shot down to the time I arrived in Bath, and uh, that is on the Baltic Sea. So I went from one extreme of Europe, and if you want to say Africa, North Africa, to the probably the most western part of, uh, of Europe, the Baltic Sea. Of course, I know Sweden and, and, and Norway is, and Greenland and all that is up through the north, northwest. What was the star lug like? Well, that's a whole, that's, that could, uh, Go a long time. <laughs> it was it was boredom, but I I managed to do things to uh, kind of uh, make the time pass. What I would like to do, if we could, because I know one of the things that you had mentioned prior to coming on the tape uh, is that you had kept a log or a journal, and one of the things that you did do was um, write in the journal. And one specific thing that you wrote. You want to tell us a little bit about that? You mean the poem? Yes. Well, uh, the, the, this log is actually a history of... It, the Red Cross provided this at, for people that were captured earlier. As, as the war went on, prisoners of war didn't get this type of book. So I... Uh, uh, I did log a lot of things. I have some drawings in here. And the Germans confiscated the book at one time and they did a lot of cutting out when you, they cut pages out. And I have the first letters I received from home. But I've, I, I've got this poem that I wrote. I didn't, I'm not sure I wrote it. I don't want to get, take credit for something I didn't do. But it was a very sentimental time. Were you married at that time, or no. you were going with your... Yes, yeah. We, we had dated maybe six months or so. Sure. Yeah. And uh, the, well, this poem, but, and I have several poems in here with pictures and everything else, but one poem was, What makes my path so easy? Why don't I ever despair? <laughs> When my days are dark and my nights are long, why don't I ever care? What keeps me always laughing, though my heart could be heavy too, when, the, when my thoughts are back and I wish I were back, why am I never blue? It's just because of you no, because I know that you'll be true when the thing is done and the battle won. I'll be back because I know of you. That's beautiful. Well, <laughs> I've got several of them in there. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's all kinds. There's some that are just crazy stuff. And, and these then, were things that kept you going while you were a prisoner? Pardon? These were things that kept you going while you were... Well, I, yes, and I also got mixed into, um, like, entertainment. I put on, I would, I'd made a couple of productions, and we, ha we did have money to buy, uh, the Germans would provide, uh, like, paints, and we could make posters and all that type of thing. And I got involved a little bit, but that's, you know, it takes a while to get to that. Bill, when you mentioned earlier, when I asked you about the um, Stalag and you said that would take quite a while, would you consider coming back and doing part two of this interview? Well, I could, yes. To, I, to talk specifically about the Stalag. And okay. So let's stop that piece for a moment. Okay. And then go on to say... How long were you, were you, did you stay in Stalag Luft 1? Yes. For how long? Uh, from 
December, I mean January, I arrived in Stalag uh, I have the, 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 the kind of the right here, but I'm not going to go poking through I a book. I think you told me the, prior to uh, taping. It would, it would be Christmas in Vienna right. in another three weeks. Let's put it the middle of January to the end of January. Of 1944? It would be 44 then, uh -huh. yes. And then when did you get out? Again, it was in May or June of 45. So, depending if you want to count the Russians, the day the Germans left would have been in May. And by the time we got organized to get out, we'd have to be another three weeks or so. And between the time you were a POW, in, you were shot down in December of 43, and you were released a year and a half later. Right. What was your physical, emotional, and m mental state at that time? Had you lost weight? I lost weight. How much? Uh, I went down to about 143 pounds when I came out of the service. I'm not come out of, when I came out of the prison camp. 143. Right, and yeah. I was only running about 160. How about emotionally? I don't think so. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I, when I was released, it was in the fall of 45, and I got into Northeastern University. I started to date and all of that, and, and it just zipped away. It didn't, I didn't hold to it. So prior to coming back home, did your family know what was happening? Did they know where you were? Yes. Could you receive mail? Yes, I have some letters here. You have some letters. And you could send mail home? I think so. But they probably... It was censored. Censored. Right. Did you have the Red Cross come in to see you yes. when you were there? And if you had medical issues, were they addressed right away? I had none, but there was a couple of apodectomies where the prisoners had to go to POWs, not prison, POWs, uh, had to go to uh, the local hospital in town. For like an appendectomy and an then they would come back? An appendectomy or a hernia or a, mm -hmm. something that was sudden or had, you know, had to be done. While in there, in the Stalag, did you hear any news about what was happening with the war? Well, that was one of the, I was involved with it a little bit. Uh, they had what they call the red, red, News, red. Uh, they, we, what we did, we had a crystal radio set that came into the compound little by little by having Germans cooperating by bringing in a tube or a, a, a dial or something of that nature, and that was hidden in the in the the main building. There was a little theater that they made. And uh, I, there was probably only very few people knew where this was hidden, and I was one of them. And I was one of them because I worked in the theatrical end of it. And um, well, my job was that if a German soldier came on the scene right away, uh, and it did happen, uh, I was to fraternized with them, which we weren't supposed to do, but I was fraternized with them, and I'd ask them how his home was and how his kids were and everything else. And they were, you know, and they, I, I got to know them like Fritz, and I got to know them very good, very close, because I talked with them a lot. So it was a dual, dual reason here. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was, I didn't want him, to, if he discovered where it was, then you know, it was, uh, it would have been, when, when the radio was located. Sure. I think they had a, they, they hunted for it all over the, the, the place. They knew what was there. They called it Red Star News. And some of the news we had that we, it was so, it's, it's, we didn't give it to the troops, we didn't tell it to the people, because uh, the German guards didn't even know about it on the outside. Like, for instance, when the, the, the Hitler was uh, 
closely assassinated with the bomb going off. We knew it, but, and the people that were the German soldiers didn't know they about didn't it. They know didn't anything. have it on German radio. Wow. Wow. How did you eat? The eating part of it was um, very, uh, at the very beginning, it was, we got Red Cross parcels, and the Germans provided a, a terrible bread and barley and rutabagas and cabbage. That's the only thing they provided. And uh, we ate good, but then the infrastructure of Germany started to become really breaking down where we didn't get Red Cross parcels and then they divided them. If a shipment came in, it would be one parcel for two people. And then in the 45, the spring of 45, to uh, the time that the war ended, uh, the infrastructure was pretty weak. That we got nothing there was for a while. You know, from that state, they, they couldn't get the Red Cross parcels through. And they, they we were probably eating as well inside as the people in the neighborhood were on the outside. We didn't know that, except they had the cows and the chickens and the eggs and, and they blew, grew vegetables. But uh, so it went from tolerable to really rough. Who were the first individuals you saw when you were liberated? Who were the what? The individuals that you saw. Who liberated you? The Russians. And then you said it did take a while to be processed. Right. Were the Russians friendly to you? The uh, Russians were, it's a whole story there. The Russian, uh, Americans went out with the automobile that they had pl planned ahead of time with the Germans to be available. And we went out, one, you know, a couple officers, high-ranking officers. And then, and then the prison camp, the, high, the highest ranking officer shot down with the commander. So one time it might be a British wing commander, and another time, I think at the very end, there was a, a general that was shot down. And uh, they, right, they went out and got the Russians. And the, all of a sudden, a whole, whole bunch of Russians came walking into the camp and took off uh, the field marshal. And he snapped orders right and left. And uh, he was probably on the same equal as Bradley or, I mean, uh, Patton or somebody else. And uh, a lot of power there. He was, he, God, he had all kinds of, of, of people. And he, we were told to stay put, not to go out of the compound. Then a bunch of Mongolians came through and on horses and like families, and they ravished the place. They took down the barbed wire and they said, Rouse, get out, and everything else. And it was, it was for about 24 hours crazy. And the American officer and the American high command was trying to tell the soldiers that the the prisoners of war, they're, you know, they're, they're people, no, no, stay put. And with the guys that did go out had rings ripped from their fingers, gold rings and watches and all that type of thing. I stayed put. I don't go for that adventure. Once you were liberated, where, how did you get out? Where did you go? Once liberated, uh, American uh, uh, planes came in, uh, C-47s, I guess, cargo C-47s, uh, and they flew out of Bath, Germany, and they took us to Camp Lucky Strike in, in uh, France. And then we waited for Liberty ships to go home. We didn't get fly home. We, we took our Liberty ships home. What was your feeling then? Do you remember? Did at, at Lucky Strike? Yeah. Well, we got a good meal, and you know. They, there again, a bunch of the guys just wanted to, they, a bunch of them just took off and went to Paris, and 
I was kind of timid. I didn't go. And they, they, of course, we were told not to go, but <laughs> it was pretty wild. You know, it was so much confusion. How long were you at Lucky Strike Field? Just, just Lucky Strike the, uh, Debarkation Center. I think probably a week or so, and they got us aboard a Liberty ship, and we sailed home. Where did you sail into? I think we sailed into the New York Harbor, but landed in New Jersey. Do you remember sailing in and fireboats? Yeah, you the saw fire the fireboats and the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, and they had they had like the fireboats and were shooting streams of water and that type of thing. Did your family know you were coming home? Well, once I got got on the soil, I called them, but they had we had four party lines in uh, <laughs> Providence and the tenements. And uh, I wasn't sure of where I was. I told them I was back on the soil, but I didn't know when I was going to get home and how it was going to happen. And I still don't know. I, I know all of a sudden I took a train from New York to Boston, to Providence, and then uh, took a cab up to the house, but nobody knew I was coming home. <laughs> Do you remember going in the front door, what it was like? Going where? Going into your front door of your home. No, uh, my my one of the things that my father said. What thing? The, the, what happened when I got home? My father apologized because he said there was a food rationing on. He could only get tea or something like that. Really? Yeah. And I kind of uh, I said, well, <laughs> but uh, he was sincere. He yeah. said, you know, you can't get chocolate anymore. Sure. sure. And. Uh, but he was, he was feeling the way that uh, most people felt at that day, just like we, you know, we can't get something in the store because of a condition. We kind of figure, well, we're making a sacrifice. Sure. Now, at that point in time, were you on leave and had to go back somewhere? Or? Yeah, I, I, we were told I went on leave, and from there we went to Atlantic City for an hour and a half. And there at Atlantic City is, uh, they had an interviewer like you're doing today, Joan, and to get our uh, individual stories. And then I think because of trying to tell them that I was in the hospital in Greece, all of a sudden in the mail I got a purple heart, but I've never lost a thimble of blood. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so, was the person who interviewed you in Atlantic City from the Air Force, or was it a, a civilian interview? No, he was a he was a military person. He I don't uh, yes. He was. I'm not saying you know he had his army or it was it was pretty. Uh, they 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 kind of went all out. There was like at the at the restaurants there. They had these big carvings of. Uh, the Air Force symbol, and they had uh, uh, good, good, pretty good food, and you know the best they they at that time we were still fighting in the Pacific, but it was kind of uh, you know rest and relaxation now and on. And then we were told we were going to get orders to go to the Pacific, and the war ended. So the war ended. Where did you go? Were nope. you out at that point? No, yeah, no. When I the war ended, I was told to go to uh, Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and I went to Fort Devens, and they just took my, you know, they said they straightened out my pay and and uh, but the money that I was going to back pay and that type of thing, and uh, they just released me and. I was actually working and still in the Army at the same time because of the accumulated leave. I was probably discharged in November, but I was released sometime in September. Of 45? Of 45. At what rank? The same rank? Oh yeah, they, you rank, once you're a prisoner of war, you're ranked and not go up. That's, that was, a real sore spot with some of the uh, the West Point guys. They'd be shot down, and all of a sudden, 
they'd come in, some guy that was a freshman or something when they were at the point. They didn't like it. <laughs> sure. So you're released at the rank of second lieutenant. Right. And where were you going to work? You said you were working. It was sort of overlapping. Where did you, where did you New work? New England Telephone Company. And then you had mentioned earlier in the interview that you were able to go to, was it Northeastern? Northeastern at night. I went to... Uh, well, I went to the Providence YMCA Institute, which was affiliated with Northeastern University. And then that was supposed to have been a two-year course. And then I went to Northeastern and uh, received a degree in Northeastern, and they gave me credits for the time that I went to the Providence YMCA Institute. And what was your degree in? Marketing. Be a business, Bachelor of Business Administration. And I'm sorry, it was called Providence YMCA Institute? Right. Okay. So you graduated, did you use? I graduated from Northeastern. With a BA. In what, 1940, you... no, 19, 19, I think 1951. While you were going to school, were you working at New England Tal at yes. that time? And when you came home, did you, you had said you sort of moved on, but did you discuss with either your family, friends, girlfriend, what had occurred as a... Oh, it would come out in conversations. But did you dwell on it? No. I tried not to. Were you, what, when did you get married? In uh, 1949 in Providence. So the, um, the girl you wrote the poem to, she did wait? Yep. And you did marry her. <laughs> did you join any units of the military reserve? Nope. Did you join any veterans organizations? Well, I'm now a Veterans for Peace. Veterans for Peace. And how long have you been with that group? Oh, about two years, due to the present situation. Meaning Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, have you received any veterans benefits, such as hospitalization, GI yeah. Bill? Did you use the GI Bill? Yeah, I did the GI Bill. And hospitalizations? Hospitalizations. Did you attend or do you attend any reunions of your old outfit? No. Did you ever go back to um, the areas where you were a prisoner of war? No. Do you have any desire to? Well, it was, that was behind the Iron Curtain. That was, uh, it, it was East Germany. And the town of Bath is no, they changed that name. And uh, if you looked up in the directory, Bath is, they would say maybe, it was, but there was some that they had a city change or a town change. And, it, you know, up until the uh, wall came down, it would, that would have, you know, I, I had no, no desire to go back. Okay. How important to you was serving in the military? Well, uh, I, I have to be guarded when I say this. The mentality I have now was different than the mentality I had then. Uh, I have read more. I have studied more. Uh, and uh, I can understand a conscientious objector. But at the time, you, like so many of your peers, felt it was the right thing to That's do. That's right. But now, because of circumstances, you're feeling right. a little differently. Do you feel in some way that it affected your life? Well, I think every incident you have in one way or another affects your life. But I think if I would say it was in 
a rather positive way. Why? Well, because it was an experience that if I hadn't, it hadn't happened, I certainly wouldn't have experienced that particular, uh, I have, tr tr you know, the, the experience of flying and, and, and traveling and, uh, and c camarades with people and uh, I was in, in the prison camp. I lived for a while with the people from South Africa and Australia and the British. I lived within a British room for a long time and I got to know people from England and it just broadened my whole uh, life experience. By living with so many people of different areas of the world, that was a positive experience. That was a positive. You. And you were all, my assumption here is you were all not only, as you said, co the camaraderie was deep, but did you help each other day to day? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. But there were an awful lot of frictions, too. And we'll go into that in part two of this, okay? okay? Um, looking back on all of this, do you have either a, a one particular memorable experience or character or humorous experience that kind of pops up to your memory? Well, they, they, I, I'm not too proud of this, but we learned how to make apple, apple uh, alcohol, I mean potato alcohol, and I drank a couple of them one time and I had a good time. <laughs> and that was in the camp? Yeah, yeah, and uh, still, uh, still. But then there was also, uh, no, it, it, just the experience of living through a traumatic type of thing it was, it was, was, was a growing experience. Is there anything or any additional comments that you would like to make to leave with those who might be viewing this tape, not only family, but certainly other veterans and individuals who are interested in the history of, in this case, World War II? Well, I, if I could, I'd like to just uh, finish with a couple of quotes. Sure. You wouldn't mind that? No. I'd like to just three quotes. And uh, first I would like to a quote from General Eisenhower. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. That's Dwight Eisenhower, and then one other I have actually, if you can let me, bear with me for two. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, for it isn't enough to talk about peace, one must believe in it. And it isn't enough to believe in it, one must work at it. And the very last one, the pretty good guy, Uh, there's no honorable way to kill, no gentle way to destroy. There is nothing good in war except its ending, Abraham Lincoln. Well, I think that certainly says a lot, and a lot about how you feel. Right. And I want to thank you so much, Bill O'Brien, William F. O'Brien, for coming <laughs> in today. And as I said, we will have part two of this um, taped at a future date. Thank okay. you so much. And thank you, Joan, thank and you. thank Madam Moss Library for its facilities, and thank the camera person for 
given for putting up with my. This is excellent. Thank okay. you very much. Okay.